And we're also dealing with toxic workplaces that would make even the healthiest, happiest person in the world want to scream into a pillow at the end of the day. You know, a, a toxic work environment will make anyone upset. Hello and welcome to What's Opera Doc, the YouTube channel for professional opera singers. Depression, eating disorder, feeling burnt out, these are topics many opera singers suffer from. Welcome, Catherine Tier. I'm very happy that you're here with us to talk about these topics. You made your career in Germany most of the time. You have been singing here a lot of years, but finally decided to leave this country, to leave this job and go back to your home country, Australia. What happened? I had um, spent most of my professional life working for the Badische Staatstheater um, in a particularly toxic, it was, I mean, as it's all come out in the last year, you know, the intendant has lost his job for um, abuse of power and uh, personal abuses. The head of the, uh, the youth theater has gone to trial for getting underage boys drunk and molesting them. The opera director that I worked under who committed more acts of professional misconduct than I can name, then went on to Zurich Opera where he's just left. And um, rather than Zurich Opera being open about the reasons he was left, they tried to suppress it, I think to avoid a scandal, but it has since come out that it was for sexual misconduct and everything that the anonymous people have described him doing in Zurich, he absolutely, I saw him do in Karlsruhe. And it was a very, it was a very interesting thing for me because there was a, 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 a culture of, you saw it and you knew it was wrong. You absolutely knew it was wrong. But if you spoke out against it, uh, you were endangering your own career or you were being too sensitive. It, it was a house that really normalized uh, professional abuse and any degree of, um, of professional misconduct. It was also a deeply, deeply sexist environment to work in. Um, unbelievable levels of misogyny um, in that place and, and, and certain standards for men uh, sorry, certain standards for women that certainly did, did not apply to men. And I actually made the mistake very early on in my time there. I was very open about um, my journey with mental health because I think that the worst thing you can do is to feel like if you have a form of mental illness that you are broken and that it's something to be ashamed of. I had depression and I had obsessive compulsive disorder since I was little and I was very open about that. And it was later used, um, it was kind of weaponized against me because um, there, is, there is a stigma attached to anyone with mental health. Then any, any complaint you make, any protest you make about injustice, oh, well, you're just crazy. Oh, you're just crazy. You're mentally imbalanced. We're living in an industry where you can't afford to show any kind of weakness or your, your liability. Um, so I, 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 I at least try to be very open about my journey because I want to try and destigmatize um, a lot of these conditions. For me, the hardest thing to admit, and it took me a very long time to be able to admit openly, was because it's so contrary to my values as a human being, but I found myself as a body positive feminist in the grips of a really serious eating disorder. And that was really, really hard for me to, to admit. And it's been really hard for me to talk openly about um, because there's part of me that feels so ashamed for developing, you know, I think like, how can you be a good feminist um, and have an eating disorder? How can you be somebody who promotes um, singers being given roles regardless of the number on a scale? Um, because you, this is something that, that makes my blood boil when you hear about people losing jobs because 
they were too large for the part. I'm like, what on earth does that mean? <laughs> um, and, you know, being someone who really fights for that and yet finding yourself <laughs> in, in the midst of an eating disorder, which really, for me, it got, I think, it got really out of control at the time when um, everything in, in the Badische Staatstheater was, was at its worst. My contract wasn't renewed. The grounds on which they didn't renew it were shaky. I will never forget in that, in that meeting, um, Spuler said to me, um, now this is just something, you know, this is just on, on a personal level. I've heard that you are somebody, and this is just a warning, you know, for your career, you do tend to have outbursts, Ausbrüche. And I just looked at him and I was very, I was, I was too polite in this meeting actually. Um, and I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you've been known to get quite, um, quite angry about certain things. And I just paused and I said, yes, when I ask three times for something to be available or when I, when I can't find three shows in a row, the prop that should be on the table and it's not there, when pieces of the set nearly fall on my head repeatedly, yes, I do have a tendency to then go backstage and be quite um, verbal about how unacceptable that is. Have I used the F word while doing so? Absolutely. I'm not going to pretend that I've been a saint and I've gone backstage and said, excuse me, but when that wall nearly fell on my head, it really frightened me quite a bit. Could we make sure that, no, I went backstage and went, are you joking? <laughs> but what I wish I had said to Peter in that moment was what you call an outburst from me, from one of my male colleagues, you would call mild assertiveness. I have seen the boys yell, scream, throw things, hit things. I had a colleague once, we were doing Ephigenie en Torrid, I'll never forget this. He was holding a flaming torch, a live flame in his hand. And he was standing on the stage and it was a Drehbühne. And he had one foot on this side of the Dreh, one foot on the other. And the stage manager for the millionth time was not paying attention. And she started the Dreh at the wrong time. So the stage started to spin and he nearly fell backwards with a flaming torch into the orchestra pit. He walked up stage, he wasn't even off stage yet, after his aria, not even off stage, and yelled out, mother, at the top of his lungs. You heard it all through the theater. Nobody told him that was an outburst. It was completely understandable. He was terrified and nearly died. But, you know, this, this, this was the difference that you're dealing with. The men could behave in a way that, you know, could be heard from the audience. But what was very funny was the head of the ensemble was in this meeting with me. And she stopped and she said, is that a reason why Kate's not being renewed? And he goes, oh, no, 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 absolutely not. And she said, well, then that was not even legal for you to bring up in this meeting. She advised me to actually, with everything that was said and how it was handled, she advised me to speak to a lawyer. She said, what has happened is just, it's completely illegal the way it's been handled, but I was too scared. I didn't want to single myself out as somebody who stood up for myself, even if I was right. It doesn't matter now because he's no longer working and hopefully will never ever be put in a position where he can abuse people the way he abused people then. But it was 10 years working in an incredibly toxic, abusive, workplace and convincing myself that that was normal and then it, it got to the point where um you know i was also doing a production with a director who was allowed to treat us however he wanted and i remember i i just i've never felt more dehumanized in my life it just felt like a thing i wasn't even a person i was just this thing um and i, I remember describing it to a friend they asked me what what's it like to work with him and i said honestly and this is not to not to diminish anyone who's had an experience of actual sexual assault but I'm like it's like being artistically raped it's like he just shoves his hand inside of you pushes you around wherever he wants he doesn't take it into account that you're a human being it was just you know the fear of of the critics and the bloggers and because now it's just the, the, the pressure that you're under because you're not just being watched by critics you're being watched by everyone with a laptop and I was certainly, you know, in Karlsruhe, Peter Spuler used to publish the blog reviews as well as the newspaper reviews. 
he considered them to be as important because that's what the everyman thinks. And it's just, it's an, it's an extraordinary pressure to feel like you're singing under that, that degree of a microscope. And you can completely then understand why the stress is such that you just, it's, it, and like I said, it's not even the toxicity of sometimes how it works in the industry. It's the toxicity of how the public reacts and the press and the bloggers and the fact that people who have absolutely no experience, no understanding really of opera and no compassion, like no compassion, can write the most horrible things. And you can't unread it once you've read it. You can't. And it plays in your head and, and, you, and you do stupid things. <laughs> And all of this was happening at once. I was also on crutches and, you know, I'd, I'd injured my leg. And, um, and I think out of all of that and, you know, trauma, I then I just uh, somehow developed a, an eating disorder as like a coping mechanism. I also think that the way that women's bodies are talked about professionally for us and viewed professionally for us is, is fairly grotesque um, and dehumanizing. And you know, we were in an opera house that had a canteen, so we'd all eat together. And I, I, I cannot even tell you the number of times that the food that I ate was commented on or the food that other women ate was commented on. But, you know, no one would comment, you know, if the boys after an opera wanted to have a big steak, no one said anything. I, you know, work out five, six days a week. I lift heavy weights. If I had a big steak, regardless, someone would say, oh my God, you eat so much. I'm like, I also, and I got into the habit of saying, yeah, but I train really hard and I did, you know, an hour and a half of weightlifting and also an hour of, of cardio. And my, my best friend in, in the world, um, Heidi Melton actually said to me, Katie, I'm begging you, you don't need to justify. If someone says, wow, that's a big steak. You just turn around and go, yeah, it is. And it's delicious. End of story. But it's, it's really looking back on it now, because as I said, at the time, you just think this is normal because that's, that's what you've, you've experienced for, for 10 years. If you experience professional instability, if you don't know where your next job is coming from, if you suddenly start to be, you know, your jobs aren't being paid as well as they used to be, if your industry is in crisis, that's going to negatively impact your mental health. Even if you're a very mentally healthy person, you're not going to be at your absolute happiest, most positive, most radiant, best self. Nobody would be. And that's how nearly every single opera singer on the planet lives 365 days a year. And I think that's where the misunderstanding falls that, well, aren't all artists crazy? And I'm like, no, but all artists are dealing with a degree of instability and insecurity that would give anyone anxiety. And we're also dealing with toxic workplaces that would make even the healthiest, happiest person in the world want to scream into a pillow at the end of the day. You know, a, a toxic work environment will make anyone upset. Um, and I think that that's something that, that really, 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 really needs to be addressed. And I, you know, there are times when I have been in a very bad way. I've, I've been in, you know, a, not a good headspace. And I have not, to be perfectly honest, I've not behaved in a way that I'm proud of. I don't think it's ever an excuse to say, well, I did that because, you know, I have depression or I have this, or I have that. You have to take responsibility and you have to say, I'm really sorry. I let, my, but I let my, um, my condition get the better of me. It will not happen again. You can't ever use it as an excuse. It's never, I just want to make it clear, it is never an excuse for bad behavior. Um, nothing is ever an excuse for bad behavior. Um, but the amount of people in the industry who take absolutely no responsibility for their bad behavior or think it's acceptable you know, a director when everything's running behind because they have terrible time management and then starts to take that out on the cast, starts to scream at people, starts to not manage their own anxiety about the fact that they're running out of time to get this right. Um, and you're nodding because you, I'm sure you've been in that production with, you know, the director who has 
spent too much time or energy somewhere and then suddenly realized, oh my God, we have, we're on stage in two weeks and we're not ready. And then their stress builds. And then before you know it, they are screaming at you. And it's like, God, dude, it's, 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 I have been in productions where for six straight weeks, you, you've, you've been screamed at for six weeks. I mean, I don't know how anybody, I don't know how anybody could spend six weeks intensively of their life getting screamed at and blamed for somebody else's poor time management and not come out the other side of that, you know, needing to spend three weeks on a tropical island <laughs> with their head in a cocktail and just... But we, but we go from that production into the next production into the next production. And I heard so many of my colleagues over the years use this word, sklaven, slaves. They honestly saw themselves as not artists, but slave labor. And yeah, this, this was a word that I heard used so, and, and, and it really not in a way that I, I think was necessarily even hyperbolic. Um, I mean, obviously it was not literal slavery, but we were being paid increasingly less because state money was increase you know there was increasingly less and less money um which meant that um productions were under far more stress because there were budget limitations there were also then time limitations so it basically you got a lack of money which led to a lack of time which led to a lack of resources which led to a huge amount of stress and it was being taken out predominantly on the singers and they were trying to do obviously as many productions as you can do with as few people in the ensemble as possible. And this is the problem when you go from one high stress production straight into the next one, or as you know, if you're in Fest, you're actually doing two or three high stress productions at the same time. And, you know, running between rehearsal rooms and, you know, trying to maintain a sense of, of mental equilibrium is very difficult, even for people who don't have depression or, or anything like that. I don't, think, I don't think any opera singer in the world right now, except maybe a very few very, very lucky singers, could would, would be able to say that they are the happiest, most balanced person they could possibly be. So I made um, the decision to put my health first. Yeah, I, I came back to Australia and I was seeking help and it was clear that it would be something that would probably take a little while. Yeah, we just, we made the decision to settle here and um, come to Tasmania and try something completely new. And at first I was going to, uh, I was gonna go and do a law degree and go into advocacy for the underprivileged. Um, and then I realized that that's that same pathological overachiever side of me that ends up with burnout and maybe just for the time being because we want to have a baby as well and we want to have a family maybe for the time being it would be best if I work with my husband we're setting up um, a, a regenerative market garden farm um, just working in agriculture and um, building a community and, and a sense of stability um, where we are, we've got a, a view of the ocean that I never get tired of and 10 hectares and it's just, it's stunning. Um, and it's made, it's made a huge, huge difference to my, to my sense of well-being. And, um, but you know, I wrote the other day, I, I put it on Facebook. I was, I was at the gym on Saturday and the prelude to Tristan came on my iPod and I started crying um, instantly. And I said, you know, because music was, was always and, and continues to be my way to God, whatever God is or the divine is, music was that path. And, you know, to, to walk away from the industry because of the toxicity in it is, is, as I said, it's like trying to work out how to pray without a temple. And, you know, as, as I've said to um, my, my agent back in Europe and, and to some people that I know back in Europe, I would absolutely still sing again if somebody offered me something, but I won't take shit. That's, I, I'm, I've, I've reached the point now where I will not stay quiet 
if I see somebody being bullied and harassed. I will not be quiet if I'm the person being bullied and harassed. Um, I feel ashamed the amount of times that I've seen one of my colleagues get picked on horribly um, by a director or a conductor or even another colleague and you don't say anything because you're just so grateful that it's not you. You know, it's like, I'm just so glad it's, and of course you say something to your colleague afterwards, like, oh my God, the way they treated you is just terrible and I'm so sorry and that really hurt my, we are all so used to going up to our friend after the rehearsal and saying, I'm so sorry you were treated like that, that, that shouldn't happen. But none of us are used to standing up in a rehearsal and saying, stop it, that's not okay. Since leaving, I, I found out, you know, things that happened to my other colleagues there that are, that are, that are no less heartbreaking. You know, a fabulous, fabulous, fabulous um, Kamazenga who was with the house for some 30 years. Um, the nicest human being you've ever met in your life. It was like everybody's uncle. Um, this, I have to say, this is a person who just did not have um, just a, a grain of malice in his heart. It was just really unusually pure person. Um, so he retired and had a meeting with Shpula or an interaction with Shpula before his retirement. And you know what all the only thing Shpula said to him? Oh, you're retiring, good, that'll save me some money. 30 years of service to that house, 30 years of doing whatever role he was asked to do, of turning up, of doing his job, of being the most delightful colleague. He was like sunshine. I, every time he was cast in a production and I had a scene with him, I knew I was gonna be happy that day. Cause it's like, having, it's like having your own little personal sunshine in the room. Oh good, that'll save me money. And I just looked at, and I heard this story. And then I said to him, I saw him personally, I went, tell me that's a rumor. That's just a terrible rumor that that's what was said to you. And he's like, do you really expect anything else? And I was, I was, I was heartbroken, but he'd gotten to the point himself where he's like, not even surprised. And to hear that these singers who have dedicated their entire careers to that house, to that public, um, to be treated as if their contribution was meaningless and it, was, it meant nothing, it's, it's disgusting. It's just disgusting. Many singers obviously are in very toxic environments. What yeah. would you recommend? What would you suggest? What can they do? I am in a very fortunate position. I can talk openly about my mental health because I'm not worried about whether it makes somebody not want to employ me or not, because I would rather never work another day in opera again than work in an environment even half as toxic as the one I was in. So I'm in a fortunate position of not needing to still be employable. I am very conscious of the fact that if I still wanted a career, I couldn't say half the things I've said in this interview. And that in and of itself is a problem because nothing that I've said has been untrue It's all been my lived experience, but that's the kind of thing that I think any singer who wants to keep working carries with them. This kind of secret world of abuse that they've dealt with that you're not allowed to speak out against. I, I want it to be a career where certain abuses of power are just not tolerated. You know, you want it to be a place of um, a zero tolerance policy when it comes to discrimination and when it comes to workplace abuse. That is not what it is. The thing is, if we lived in a world where it was just conductors and some, uh, sorry, directors and sometimes conductors, well, actually not sometimes, very often conductors behaving badly, but the opera administration, you know, opera directors, intendants were people that you could trust. If that was the world we lived in, then you just go and make uh, an appointment with your opera director or with the intendant and someone from human resources. And you say, listen, I have experienced the following workplace misconduct in the rehearsal room. I would really appreciate some mediation or could somebody please be present and observe this or somebody needs to speak to whomever is behaving like this and rectify the situation much like you would in an office. But unfortunately we are living in a world in which the administration is every bit as toxic as what's happening in a, in a rehearsal room. And I mean, I, I certainly know from my own experiences in Karlsruhe, um, 
you know, the opera directors, when I was there, the first one was lovely, but didn't do anything, was useless, was just under Schuller's thumb the entire time. Uh, the second one was the lovely Michael Fichtenholz, who, you know, we shan't even speak of. Um, and the third that I didn't have as much to do with as I'd like to was Nicole Breunger, who I know was trying so hard to change the system, but I think I... Okay, again, I can't, I can't say for certain because it's all rumour, but I, 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 from what I've heard, she was being horribly treated herself and unable. I, I do think that she was, um, she was a force for good and she's somebody who, you know, certainly she was, came to the ensemble after I left. Um, but had she been there when I was in the ensemble, she's someone I would have trusted actually to go to and say, could you please uh, speak to the director? The problem is that if the intendant loves the director, the director can do whatever they like. So my advice would be, if you feel like you can trust the administration, do it officially. Speak to somebody in the administration and ask them, follow the correct channels of, And but if somebody is really victimizing you and really treating you improperly, I don't think there's ever any shame in simply just turning around and saying, I will not be spoken to like that. Or if they're treating your colleague horribly, to just say, I'm sorry, I'm not comfortable being in a rehearsal room in which I'm witnessing abuse. All you can do is just, you don't have to be aggressive, but just calmly say, I'm sorry. No, a, a quiet boundary. If that boundary is then not respected, that's the other person's problem. But as I said, it's, it's sadly a huge risk because we're all so replaceable. If all that was true, what you told us now, somebody could ask, Why didn't you leave earlier? <laughs> um, there was nowhere to go. It was, um, I was too scared. I just thought if I just work a little harder, if I just show them a little bit more, they'll appreciate me. They'll see what I'm worth. I just, I really need to prove myself. And oh, so stupid. that would be some advice that I give someone. If you're staying in a place where people don't appreciate you because you think you'll change their minds, don't, you never will. It's like trying to get the attention of a romantic interest when they're not interested in you. Just, just go find the person who loves you. They're out there. But we prided ourselves on it. We prided ourselves on being able to be abused over and over and over and over and over again and getting back up. And I'm like, and I'm, I'm really realizing that, that that was my pattern, certainly, when if I'd had a little bit more self-worth and probably self-love and compassion, I just would have gone, no. Thank you very much for speaking up so bravely and openly. And uh, I wish you a lot of luck, a lot of health and a lot of thumbs up from our community. <laughs> and so thank you very much. So, and yep. best of luck. Yep. And if anyone is, is experiencing career burnout and COVID lets you come down to Tasmania, you can stay with us, just muck about on a farm for a bit and relax.